What is the real history behind the Doctor Who episode The Witchfinders and how accurate was it? We're here to find out. Welcome to my channel, I'm Juliet, I'm a history lecturer at a British university and I'm also, as you can probably tell, a huge Doctor Who fan. I know some of you watching might be new to Doctor Who, you might have just discovered it on Disney+, Plus. so I'm going to start by giving a very, very quick potted history of the show so I can explain where this episode falls within the history of Doctor Who in case you haven't seen it. If you are a Doctor Who fan and you already know all this stuff, then feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter. Doctor Who is the longest running science fiction show of all time. It started on the BBC in 1963 and there are three main phases to the show and we've just started the third one, which is why the current season is called Season 1 on Disney+. Plus. The first phase of the show was the classic phase, which was 1963 to 1989 and featured the first to seventh Doctors. It if you haven't picked up on this from uh, the show, the Doctor is able to regenerate because they are an alien. They are able, when they die, uh, to regenerate their form and basically turn into a new actor. So there were seven Doctors in the original classic run of the show. I started watching Doctor Who with the episode that doesn't fit anywhere, which is the 1996 uh, American collaboration TV movie starring Paul McGann as the eighth Doctor. He is my Doctor, he's my favourite. I loved that episode, but not enough other people did, and it was just a one-off. Then we get the second main phase, which was called New Who, um, but it isn't anymore because now we have a newer third phase. Um, I think people are starting to call it the revival era. Um, Maybe we haven't really fixed on a name yet. This is the phase of the show that runs from 2005 to 2022. This features the 9th through 13th Doctors plus a couple of extras. Uh, there's a war doctor who's suddenly revealed to have existed between 8 and 9. There's a doctor that's just a hand that then turns into a doctor-human hybrid and that never gets included in the numbering. Um, and the 14th doctor is played by the same actor as the Tenth Doctor. This is the phase that this episode falls into. The Witchfinders is one of the later episodes of what I'm going to call the Revival Era. It features the Thirteenth Doctor, who is played by Jodie Whittaker. There were three showrunners during the Revival Era. Russell T Davis, who is now back again for the new New Era, Stephen Moffat and Chris Chibnall. Chris Chibnall only oversaw a fairly short period of time, although there was Covid in there, so it's a bit longer than the amount of episodes would suggest. Uh, with just one Doctor, the 13th Doctor. Jodie Whittaker was the first person to play the Doctor who was not a white man, so there are a few episodes that talk about that, and this is one of them, The Witchfinders. The Chibnall era, as it is known among fans, is not the most popular. Um, some of the storytelling choices were controversial. Some of the storytelling just wasn't as effective, shall we say. Some episodes just didn't quite work. Um, but I really love the 13th Doctor. I love the, the characterization of the 13th Doctor, I love Jodie Whittaker's performance, and of course for me as a white woman the fact that the Doctor suddenly looked like me was awesome. This era did also introduce a, the fugitive Doctor who is a very mysterious Doctor played by Joe Martin who is a woman of colour, so it was really expanding um, the forms that the Doctor could take that weren't a white man. Um, Obviously that has now continued into the current era where the Doctor is a person of colour. So I enjoy the Chibnall era and the 13th Doctor because I enjoy that version of the character. But the other thing that the Chibnall era did really, really well is historicals. So you've probably noticed, if you've started watching the new season, there are basically three or four types of Doctor Who story. There's stories set on contemporary Earth, like the Christmas special that kicked off the new season and is Shooty Gatwa's first episode as the 15th Doctor and Millie Gibson's first episode as Ruby Sunday. These are usually alien invasions of Earth, most often Cardiff pretending to be London. But the Doctor's time machine slash spaceship, the TARDIS, which stands for Time and Relative Dimensions in Space, is able to travel anywhere in time and space. It looks like a 1960s police box because it is supposed to have a chameleon circuit that will make it disguise itself as something that fits into its surroundings, but it's been broken since the pilot, which was set in contemporary London in 1963. Police boxes were already a bit old by then. They're basically phone boxes where you can go and call the police for no charge. So that's why they're blue instead of red, the traditional colour for a regular phone booth in the UK. And obviously they're not around anymore for many obvious reasons. But it can travel anywhere in time and space. 
So the other types of Doctor Who episode are future episodes. Now these could be on a spaceship or a space station, or they could be on an alien planet. And then there's historicals, uh, stories set at some point in Earth's history. The actual original purpose of the show back in the 60s was to teach children about science and about history. So the future set episodes are supposed to teach them about science, and the historicals are supposed to teach them about history. Nowadays this will generally involve an alien invasion of some kind. Uh, the original historicals in the 60s were actually just stories set within that historical period period and didn't involve any science fiction apart from the TARDIS landing there. Um, but then they disappeared for quite a while, they were quite unpopular for a little while, and when they came back uh, they always came accompanied by some kind of alien invasion of Earth. Doesn't have to be an invasion, an alien visitation to Earth or something. The Chibnall era did historicals really, really well. Whatever the problems are with the storytelling and whatever else is going on in the Chibnall era, the historicals in that era were brilliant. I love them. So if you want to dip into the Chibnall era but you've heard it's not very good and you're not very sure, they're standalone stories, especially in the first season of the Chibnall era, which is where this episode comes from, just watch the historicals. If you just watch the historicals, it is a brilliant era of Doctor Who. So this episode features Jodie Whittaker as the 13th Doctor, alongside her trio of companions who she referred to as the Fam, which not everybody liked, I have to say. Uh, Bradley Walsh as Graham, Tossin Cole as Ryan, who is Graham's step-grandson, and Mandip Gill as Yaz. Brief recap of the episode if you haven't watched it recently, or indeed at all. The gang land near Pendle Hill in the early 17th century, this is in Lancashire in the north of England, and they witness an old woman being ducked on a ducking stool as a test for witchcraft where the woman is ducked into the water, and if she sinks she's innocent, and if she floats she's guilty. The Doctor tries to save the old woman but fails and she dies. The Doctor then uses their psychic paper, um, something Russell T Davis introduced so that people would believe them and let them into places where it says whatever the Doctor wants it to say, or whatever the person expects it to say, and she claims to be the Witchfinder General. The landowner, Becca Savage, says that Satan is blighting the crops, bewitching animals, plaguing people with fits, sickness and visions, and that there's a bunch of witches in league with him. Then the King turns up. This is King James I of England, who is also King James VI of Scotland. He assumes that Graham must be the head Witchfinder, because Graham is a man and the Doctor is a woman, and this is one of the relatively early 13th Doctor episodes, so this is really the first time the Doctor has encountered this type of sexism in kind of an Earth historical episode. Meanwhile, Yaz has gone off after Willa, the granddaughter of the old lady who was killed in the ducking stool, and Yaz sees a mud tendril appear while Willa does a ritual by her granny's grave. Willa reveals that her and Becca are actually cousins, and that Becca married up, and they were both raised by her granny, who made potions and teas and so on as a healer. The doctor then finds something alive in the mud which reanimates granny's corpse along with several other people who've recently died. So they're basically zombies, um, but it's it's not really them, it's the, the mud aliens possessing their dead bodies. The mud creatures kill the king's bodyguard Alfonso, of whom he was very fond, and then Becca accuses the Doctor of witchcraft and says her sonic screwdriver is her wand. The sonic screwdriver is one of the Doctor's favourite tools. The current one doesn't look very much like a screwdriver, but previously to Shuti Gatwa, um, the screwdriver had always looked like a screwdriver. I do actually have one. Hold on. I found it! <laughs> this is my sonic screwdriver, the battery's gone, it did used to light up. Um, this is either the 12th or 13th Doctor, so it's either Peter Capaldi's or Jodie Whittaker's Doctor, we can't 100% remember. Um, but this is what the sonic screwdriver used to look like. Um, the design would vary from Doctor to Doctor, uh, but it was always, because it was supposed to be a screwdriver, albeit one that is somehow sonic, um, and it's gradually turned into something that can do all sorts of things. Um, there's very few things the sonic screwdriver can't do these days. Uh, but it is meant to be a screwdriver, so it was always screwdriver shaped. So this is what it uh, looks like in the episode. So Becca says um, that the sonic screwdriver is the Doctor's witch's wand. The Doctor is then tied up to a tree and interrogated by the King. Meanwhile, the fam follow the mud aliens to Becca's house. The Doctor is ducked but manages to get out of the ducking stool, which she says is because she learned how to do that from Houdini on a very wet, long weekend. The mud people then come for Becca, who is weeping mud. 
She reveals that she cut down Granny's favourite tree and then found the mark of Satan growing on her afterwards. So she started the witch hunt and ultimately killed her own Granny as an attempt to get rid of Satan's mark and shift the blame to other people. Then she gets taken over by the mud aliens and demands the king, explaining that they were imprisoned on Pendle Hill for alien war crimes until Becca broke the lock by uh, cutting down the tree and that they want the king's body for their king. But the tree was used to make the ducking stool. So our hero heroes take the ducking stool, which is the remains of the tree, up the hill to re-imprison the mud aliens, who are actually called the Morax, and rescue the king. But the king unnecessarily kills Becca, who could have recovered her body. Um, she's the only one who wasn't already dead when they took over her body and the aliens are getting imprisoned, so she would have been okay, but he kills her. Um, and the doctor is then deeply unimpressed uh, and leaves. And that's the end of the episode. So what is the history behind this episode? There were various types of magical practitioners and lots of names for them in early modern England. The early modern period is in British history, basically from about the Tudors, Henry VII, Henry VIII, up to different people put different endpoints on it, but I usually go for the Napoleonic Wars around 1815. So these various magical practitioners might go by the names of sorcerers, cunning folk, wizards, white witches, black witches, dreamers, seers, soothsayers, fortune tellers, enchanters, necromancers, whites, the list goes on. Some of those might be names that people might take for themselves, others might be names that are attached to them by other people, particularly things like necromancer. And the same person might be called different things by different people depending on how they view that person and the magical practices that they are known for. The majority of all categories are women, although there are men as well, and a cunning man, witch finder or witch doctor might be consulted in order to prosecute a witch or find a witch, or, on the other hand, they might be prosecuted for witchcraft themselves. So you might use a cunning person, a cunning man or a cunning woman, again, more often a man on the witchfinder side, um, you might use them to find or prosecute a witch, but they're equally vulnerable to being prosecuted for witchcraft themselves. Granny, in the episode, would come under this heading of cunning folk. She makes potions and teas and they're intended to help people and she's known in the village for doing that. Witchcraft trials were not as numerous in England as in some other places, but they did, of course, happen. Usually it was individual cases, two, three, one person uh, being accused of witchcraft and put on trial for it. Um, but there were two witch crazes, uh, one of them in East Anglia a bit later in the 17th century and one of them that is part of the inspiration for this episode. Parliament had passed a witchcraft act which defined witchcraft as a crime punishable by death in 1542. It was repealed five years later, but restored again by a new act in 1562. A further law was passed in 1604 by the then new king, James I, new king of England, James I. He took a very keen interest in demonology, as we will see. The 1562 and 1604 acts transferred the trial of witches from the church to ordinary courts. So previous to 1562, witchcraft had been seen as very much a religious crime that it was up to the church to prosecute and deal with, because it's a essentially heresy, especially if it involves making pacts with the devil and things like that. But these laws of 1562 and 1604 transferred the prosecution of witchcraft as a crime to secular courts, not church courts. Witchcraft trials were usually held as part of Aziz's. This is part of the English justice system. They were periodic criminal courts hearing serious cases that carried the death penalty or life imprisonment. And they were part of the English and then the UK justice system until 1972, although they weren't still prosecuting witchcraft in 1972. In this episode, first the Doctor and then Graham are referred to as the Witchfinder General. This is a nickname associated with Matthew Hopkins. He, together with his partner, was the instigator of the most notorious and most deathly witch hunt in English history, uh, which happened in East Anglia, 1645 to 1647, and resulted in the deaths of over 100 people. Now, there were more witch trials in Scotland, um, but that was the biggest uh, and it is the most famous in England. We see throughout this episode James the first and sixth's very deep interest in witchcraft and demonology. James lived 1566 to 1625 and he was King James VI of Scotland from 1567, so from when he was one year old. At that time England and Scotland were separate kingdoms, but because Elizabeth never married or had any heirs, James became the heir to the throne of England. 
So when Queen Elizabeth died, Queen Elizabeth I obviously, uh, in 1603, James became James I of England. So he's James I and VI, or VI and I, um, because he is James VI of Scotland uh, separately from being James I of England, and he's King of Scotland for a lot longer as well. He quotes the motto of the Order of the Garter, which is Oni soit qui me pense. Um, evil to him who thinks evil of me. Uh, the Order of the Garter was founded by King Edward III in 1348 and is the most senior order of knights in the British honours system. James tells Ryan in the episode, My father died when I was a baby. He was murdered by my mother, who was imprisoned and beheaded. I was raised by regents. One was assassinated, one died in battle, another died in suspicious circumstances. There have been numerous attempts to kidnap me, kill me, or blow me up. It's a miracle I'm still alive. Uh, this is all true. Um, his mother was Mary Queen of Scots, famously executed by Queen Elizabeth I after being imprisoned for many years um, under suspicion of plotting against Elizabeth with Catholics, um, because she was Catholic. And the most famous attempt to blow him up was the gunpowder plot of 1605, which uh, Guy Fawkes was involved in. Guy Fawkes was the one who was actually supposed to blow up the Houses of Parliament and got caught. Um, and which is still commemorated in England every year on Bonfire Night. Um, one of our weirdest traditions, uh, which I have talked about before and I will do a whole video on at some point. And the reason the episode brings all that up is that James was understandably paranoid. Um, it's that classic thing of it's not paranoia if they really are all out to get you. Um, so he was very afraid of conspiracy because there had been so many actual conspiracies and attempts on his life, as well as the murder slash executions of both his parents. He led one of the biggest witch hunts in Scottish history in 1590. He was afraid that a coven of witches led by the Earl of Bothwell were conspiring against him to prevent his fiancée, Princess Anne of Denmark, from getting to him and to murder him. There was another major Scottish witch hunt in the mid-1590s, and after that he wrote his famous treatise on witch hunting demonology in 1597. This was a response to sceptical witchcraft treatises written by Johann Weyer and Reginald Scott in 1563 and 1584, and the doctor finds a copy of the demonology in Becker's room. It is important to realise that not everybody believed in witchcraft or thought that witches should be prosecuted and executed or, you know, it wasn't a universal belief. There were treatises written that were sceptical of the very idea of witchcraft, there were people who said, this is silly, stop saying people are witches. It wasn't the case that everybody everywhere completely believed um, that people were witches and should be executed. And of course there's the cunning folk who in many times and places, in, including through the early modern period, are doing their thing, making their potions um, and healing and so on and so forth and just getting on with it. They aren't all being uh, prosecuted and executed as witches. And we already mentioned that in England major witch hunts are relatively rare. And James himself was genuinely concerned to find witches. He did believe in witchcraft as a, a thing, and he was afraid of witches, he was afraid of them conspiring against him and so on, but he didn't want to convict innocent people. He wasn't just kind of, oh, that person's a bit suspicious, they're a witch. He genuinely wanted to find witches who were actually dangerous, as he believed, and um, he wasn't kind of just going after people for no reason. In 1605, he referred the case of Anne Gunter's witchcraft accusations on to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the accusation was eventually exposed as a fraud. He uncovered another fraudulent set of accusations in Leicester in 1616. His views also may have shifted slightly over time. The 1590s, uh, while he was King of Scotland but not England, was really the height of his fear, although he obviously continued his interest, um, because it's usually assumed that Shakespeare wrote Macbeth partly to appeal to the new king, which obviously prominently features witches and witchcraft. We see at the very opening of the episode and throughout, and it's key to the conclusion, the ducking stool. This was a leftover from the medieval ordeal. This was part of medieval English law, where an accused person who would not confess and could not be proved guilty could undergo an ordeal to get God to prove their innocence. So the idea of either innocent until proven guilty or the need for conviction beyond reasonable doubt, those don't exist as legal principles yet. Somebody can confess, they can be proved to be guilty with eyewitnesses, or they can undergo an ordeal to get God to prove their innocence. So these are things like carrying a hot iron a certain distance and showing after the hand was bandaged for a few days that God had miraculously healed their flesh, or putting their arm into hot water and similarly revealing a healed limb after bandaging, 
or they might be thrown into a body of cold water and they're innocent if they sink to the bottom. That's obviously a major part of the origin for the ducking stool. Or they might be asked to swallow something in one gulp without choking. Uh, another option was for them or their chosen champion to fight a duel to prove their innocence, which obviously a lot of people are familiar with from Game of Thrones. By the 16th century, eyewitness proof or a confession was required to find somebody guilty, so that reduced the use of ordeals but led to a rise in torture because one of the only ways to prove someone guilty was to get them to confess. Now obviously we know that torture does not get the truth out of people, <laughs> it just gets them to lie and say whatever you want to hear to make the torture stop. Um, but in the early modern period they didn't know that and they saw torture as a way to get a confession out of somebody um, if they couldn't prove it with eyewitnesses. But they did also still use the ducking stool in some cases to test for witchcraft. As Becca notes in the episode, it was originally used as a non-lethal punishment for female scolds and nags and for dishonest tradespeople. There are a few medieval and early modern punishments for women who talk too much. Um, one of those depressing areas of history. Here are some of the punishments that might be inflicted on scolds or nags and the ducking stool was another. It wasn't intended to be lethal, it was intended to be humiliating. You duck them and then you lift them up again out of the water. But when used as a test for witchcraft, obviously it could be quite dangerous if you're leaving them under the water too long trying to see if they're going to sink or float. Not everybody approved of the ducking stool. Burgundian Henri Bouget noted that some people use it to test witches and said, I doubt whether this practice does not serve rather to tempt God than to prove anything against the witch who is ducked. For Satan may let a guilty one sink to the bottom or an innocent one float on the water so that he may cause an innocent man to be put to death wrongfully and so protect the guilty. So not everybody approved of it. But James VI and I was a fan. In demonology, he said, there are two other good helps that may be used for their trial. The one is the finding of their mark, the other is their floating on the water. So it appears that God hath appointed for a supernatural sign of the monstrous impiety of the witches that the water shall refuse to receive them in her bosom that have shaken off them the sacred water of baptism and willfully refused the benefit thereof. So because they have refused their sacred baptism by turning to the devil, uh, water will not accept them. Not so much as their eyes are able to shed tears, threaten and torture them as ye please, while first they repent, God not permitting them to dissemble their obstinacy in so horrible a crime. Albeit that womankind especially be able other ways to shed tears at every light occasion when they will, yea, although it were dissemblingly like the crocodiles. <laughs> so you can tell from that that both his fondness for the ducking stool and his sexism are entirely historically accurate as depicted in the episode. James I and VI both had some opinions about women um, and uh, thought the ducking stool was a good test for witches. The other one he mentioned was the witch's mark and this comes up in the episode as well. Um, the depiction of this one is not quite accurate to what he says in the demonology. In the episode he has this thing that he's going to prick the mark with and he says a true witch will not bleed if her mark is pricked. Uh, that isn't quite what he says in the demonology. Um, in the demonology he says that the witch's mark is insensible, which implies that it's numb. So not so much that it won't bleed, but that the witch won't feel it if you prick it. So obviously if somebody has a numb area on their body for whatever reason, then they are liable to fail that test. But the idea that when a witch made a pact with the devil he would put his mark on some hidden part of their body was common in the period and is something that James suggests as a way to test for a witch. Now I said them, um, witches could be male or female, the vast majority of people who were accused of witchcraft and executed for it were female, but there were male witches who were accused and executed as well. And there were also male magical practitioners of various kinds. James mentions one in the episode. He says, like Dr. D, a necromancer. John D lived 1527 to 1609 and had a reputation as a conjurer or magician. He was a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge and a royal advisor first in England and then on the continent. He was interested in alchemy, astrology, angels and the Philosopher's Stone. And note the name Philosopher, not Sorcerer's Stone, which is what the American publishers of Harry Potter decided to rename it. But it's a Philosopher's Stone. People who were trying to find the Philosopher's Stone, or work out how to make one, were interested in wisdom. Philosophy literally means love of wisdom, from the Greek philos and sophos. Uh, love and wisdom. Philosophers were trying to learn about the world around them. 
just like the ancient Greek philosophers who were their forebears. The philosopher's stone was trying to learn about the world around them and create something that would turn lead into gold or give you eternal youth because that would be handy. It was all wrapped up with magical practices and of course we would generally consider alchemy and trying to create philosopher's stones and so on to be part of magical practice. Um, but it had nothing to do with deals with the devil, with that type of illegal heretical witchcraft. It's something else entirely. John Dee did try to talk to spirits and angels and that's probably where this line about him being a necromancer comes from. So not a necromancer in the sense of raising corpses like the mud aliens do in the episode, but a necromancer in the sense of uh, what would later be being a medium, um, trying to talk to spirits uh, and angels. So I've mentioned once or twice that there are two major witch hunts in English history and one of them was the one in East Anglia led by Matthew Hopkins. The other one is a big part of the inspiration for this episode. The characters in the episode are fictional, so Willa and Becca and Granny, they're all completely fictional characters. But the story is inspired by a real witch hunt that happened in the area at that time. This is known as the case of the Pendle Witches or the Lancashire Witches. And it is apparently quite well known, and the area has at least at one point been quite touristy. Um, according to a book written in 2002, The Lancashire Witches, Histories and Stories, um, there was quite a lot of kind of touristy stuff and souvenirs and things um, in the area around Pendle Hill, a bit like Salem in the US. I don't know if that's still there. I did look into whether I could go up there and do some filming up there for the video, uh, but unfortunately it's a little bit too far away and I can't afford the petrol to get up there this week. Um, I will do it another time. But this is uh, two connected witch hunts that happened in the same area and within a couple decades of each other. The main one happened in 1612 and this is the one that is the inspiration for this episode. 18 people, mostly from near Pendle Hill and one from York, were accused of witchcraft. Two men, eleven women, and five people we don't know details of because they were acquitted and we don't actually know who they were, their names or gender or anything. One woman, Elizabeth Southerns, otherwise known as Old Demdike, died in jail, and one, Margaret Pearson, was found guilty of non-capital witchcraft and sentenced to four days in the pillory and a year in prison. So you can see again it's not as simple as you're a witch, burn the witch, and they're not burned anywhere, they're hanged. Uh, that is it's not as simple as that. Uh, Margaret Pearson was found guilty, but not of a capital offence. The remaining nine women and two men were hanged, one of them, Jeanette Preston in York, and the other ten all at the same time on Lancaster Moor on the 20th of August 1612. The main source for this witch hunt is a text called The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in the County of Lancaster by Thomas Potts. Wonderful in this case doesn't mean good, it means um, fantastical. Uh, it's that sense of the word. Potts was an associate clerk and he published this record of the trial in London in 1613. In the text he makes various allusions to King James I and VI and to James's writings on witchcraft and the demonology. There's no actual evidence that James was involved in this particular witch hunt and trial, but it may have been an attempt to curry favour with him because of his known interest in witch hunting and witchcraft. It's also not completely impossible that he was there, um, there isn't any evidence that he was, but lack of evidence is not always evidence of lack. There was another witch hunt in the same area a little bit later, 1633-34, to 34, which is less well documented. Uh, in that case a young boy, Edmund Robinson, accused Francis, the wife of John Dickinson, Jeanette Hargreaves, the wife of Henry Hargreaves, Jeanette Davis, possibly Jeanette Device, the child who was one of the main witnesses in the 1612 case, William Davis, her half-brother or Device, and Busa of being witches. This kicked off a witch hunt that led to the imprisonment of possibly up to 60 people, accusations against at least 20. Margaret Johnson, one of them, confessed in 1634 that the devil appeared to her in the similitude or proportion of a man apparelled in a suit of black tied about with silk points. The devil does have the best clothes. Uh, and then they made a pact um, and they had relations. This is presumably a confession produced by torture or possibly Margaret Johnson believed that she was a witch and, and had made a pact with the devil. It is of course not impossible for people to um, either genuinely be practicing witchcraft or to have um, 
visions and dreams and hallucinations that make them believe that's the case. Or it may just have been the result of torture and she's lying to stop the torture, which is the most common. All but one of the accused were found guilty, but the judge refused to pass sentence and the boy and his father, Edmund Robinson, were taken down to London to be examined by the King Charles I. This is after the death of James. And at that point, the boy confessed to having made it up. He also mentioned in another deposition that he had heard his neighbours talk of a witch feast that was kept at Mocking or Malkin Tower in Pendle Forest about 20 years ago. So Edmund Robinson is too young to remember the 1612 case, but he's obviously heard about it. And the rumour and traditions around that case that was still being talked about seem to have been what inspired his later set of accusations. Although he retracted his accusations and confessed to having made it all up, many of the accused were still in prison in 1636 and even 1637. So although Willa and Becca and Granny are fictional characters, and of course the mud aliens, the Morax, are definitely fictional, there is an historical basis to this episode. And we know that it is the 1612 case in particular that's inspired it, because at one point Becca makes a reference to the King's New Bible. This is the King James Version of the Bible, the translation of the Bible into English, that is one of the best known English translations of the Bible there is. Um, this is still used often in modern churches, partly because of the just beauty and poetry of the translation. It, it's a very poetic and beautiful translation. If you hear a passage from the Bible quoted in rather archaic and old-fashioned sounding English, chances are you're hearing a quotation from the King James Bible. And the King James Version, or King James Bible, was published in 1611. So Becker's reference to the King's New Bible suggests that it, it is very much specifically the 1612 uh, case that inspired the story. And just to cover another few bits and pieces of history that don't directly relate to the witchcraft that I spotted as I watched the episode, uh, at one point they make a reference to the accents. They realise they must be near to their home because Yaz and Ryan come from Sheffield, Graham was living in Sheffield, and the Doctor has a northern accent, second Doctor with a northern accent after Christopher Eccleston. They say, oh, they recognise the accents and realise they must be close to home. Pendle Hill in Lancashire is relatively close close to Sheffield. But <laughs> actually an early modern English accent would be very unlikely to sound much like a modern one. Regional accents might be closer, um, so any regional dialect that hasn't changed as much since the early modern period, the accent would probably be closer as well. So things like the Black Country accent and dialect from the Midlands is quite distinctive and probably would be quite similar to an early modern Black Country accent. So the northern accents probably would be more similar than some other accents, but they wouldn't necessarily be that recognisable. Most English accents would probably sound more like an American accent to modern ears than a modern English accent. Um, historians work this kind of thing out by doing things like looking at the rhyme schemes in Shakespeare plays. Um, and sometimes if you read them in an American accent, they make more sense. So we think that the early modern English accent might actually have been similar to the modern American accent. The King is Scottish. Um, ironically, Scottish actor Alan Cumming is putting on an English accent to play the King. Um, but again, of course, the King is not going to have the accent of a Scottish Highlander. Um, he is being raised by regents and nobles. In the 20th century, a lot of Scottish aristocracy would have quite English sounding accents. So that's why uh, he's gone with that particular accent choice. Exactly what James I and VI accent would have sounded like in real life? Pff, who knows? <laughs> There's a point where um, they ask Becca, why are you walking? Where are the horses? Because it would make sense for the nobility to be riding horses if they're going any distance. Um, Becca says it's because she had them all killed um, because they were being used by the witches. Um, this is just the BBC budget talking. <laughs> Usually, witches are accused of killing horses. Um, horses are extremely valuable animals. Animals suspected to be witches' familiars are much more likely to be animals like cats. Cats are useful animals, and I love them, let's establish that, um, but um, cats are less economically valuable animals. So you're much more likely to accuse a cat of being a witch's familiar and kill it and there is a fairly well-known stereotype of cats as witches familiars. They're not the only animal that might be thought of as a familiar, but one of the most common. A horse? That is a valuable animal. You're very unlikely to decide that's a witch's familiar and kill it. Um, much more likely to accuse a witch of killing your horse. So Becca claiming that she killed all the horses is just the BBC budget talking, um, because they don't have the budget 
for horses. We also see King James flirting shamelessly with Ryan, who he takes quite a shine to. James had intense romantic relationships with men. He did consider a specific illegal homosexual act, which I am not going to name, but a specific male homosexual act was illegal, and James thought that was as bad a crime as witchcraft or murder. But he did have these very, very intense and quite romantic relationships with men. And it's the kind of thinking that you see in the past. It's not the way we think now. But people in the past would sometimes separate the physical from the emotional and the mental. And even now, you know, there's a difference between somebody's uh, romantic orientation and their sexual orientation. So James disapproved of certain physical homosexual acts, but he had these very intense relationships with men. So you can't really put modern labels on people in the past, they just think so differently about this kind of thing. Um, but if we wanted to try and put a modern label on him, we could say he was kind of romantically homosexual. To depict him as having romantic interest in men is entirely historically accurate, despite his opinion on certain sex acts. And finally, the internet thinks bobbing for apples was brought to Britain by the Romans. We see people bobbing for apples not at Halloween at the beginning. I am a Roman specialist. I have never come across anything talking about the Romans bringing bobbing for apples to Britain. Um, and I have yet to see a single citation of an actual Roman primary source for this information, but that doesn't mean it's not true. So if you know of one, if anybody knows a primary source that implies the Romans brought bobbing for apples to Britain, then please put it in the comments and let me know. I'd be fascinated to find out. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like and subscribe to my channel for myth, legend, folklore, witchcraft, ghost stories, and weird and wonderful history in general. Until next time, bye! High five! High five! High five!